there's far less evidence to support attempts to trace specific modern breeds to distinct ancient lineages. And in fact, as late as the 1500s, and even in the early 1800s, British writers only were identifying about 15 things that we would call breeds. And again, these were described in very general terms, almost in the same language as this Roman writer uh, a, millennium, a millennium and a half earlier was using. They, they, they were descriptions of general function. They, they were not any kind of, of terms such as we would use today for breeds. They were things like shepherd's dog, water spaniel, and the like. And um, of course, modern dogs, even ones supposedly having um, you know, certain breed-specific functions, you know, generally have little utilitarian um, function or even ability today. Um, I mentioned earlier this fact that it is striking that, you know, when you look worldwide, um, probably as much as three quarters of the dogs out there who are very successfully reproducing in the company of man are feral and untamed. And actually, feral is probably a misleading term. I should, probably shouldn't have even used it, because they are domestic species in the sense, or at least human commensals in the sense, that they are living in the company of human society. You can contrast that with cats. I mean, cats that are not brought up in the company of humans really are wild animals. Um, they you, you, are essentially unchanged in their genotype, in their behavior from the African wild cat that they're descended from. Dogs, even unowned, untamed village dogs throughout the world, um, unwanted by the humans around them, are a very different animal from their wolf ancestors. Even in the United States, probably less than half of dogs that are bred are bred uh, in a way that their reproduction was controlled by humans. The typical village dog type that's found throughout Asia and Africa, and indeed the typical mutt everywhere, shows none of the accentuated uh, wolf type behaviors, wolf hunting pattern behaviors I showed you on that earlier slide that go into the utilitarian breeds. In fact, it's a dog that shows little, if any, of the ancestral wolf hunting behavior at all. It's a scavenger, very well adapted to caging and wheedling food out of reluctant humans as its primary biological adaptive trait. And then, of course, at the other end of the scale, breeding for dog shows has also produced breeds that have little, if any, of the characteristics reputed to have been their whole raison d'etre. I was trying to find a slide from the movie Best in Show, but I couldn't get it. Uh, <laughs> But I thought these guys almost looked the same as the character. There was a, a very interesting st um, analysis done um, just a few years ago um, by a Swedish researcher who looked at four different sort of basic personality traits of uh, char uh, characters of modern dogs. And he looked at, uh, I can't remember how large the sample size, it was quite large. Uh, I've plotted two of them here. I don't know, he did four, but I didn't know how to plot things in four dimensions, even with PowerPoint. But um, the, it comes out basically the same. Each point on this graph represents one breed. And as you can see with the key, the different color or shape is key to the group it belongs to, working, herding, terriers, hounds, gun dogs. Now, you would think if breeds were still really reflecting an ancestral breeding lineage based on, fundamentally on their utilitarian function, you would see clustered. You would expect like all of the uh, red squares, which represent herding dogs, to cluster in one spot and be very different from the hounds who are these blue, um, I mean, these X's. You'd expect them to all cluster together, but it almost looks like somebody just threw these all on this graph here. 
And when he did analyze, he said, okay, are there statistically any clusters? Do you find certain dog breeds clustering together? He did find four clusters, but again, within each of these, you see all kind, you see representatives from many different groups clustering together. And so, in other words, there was very little correlation between sort of basic personality characteristics of modern breeds, looked at it on a fairly objective basis, and their supposed breeding for a particular purpose. Well, I've been hinting from the start that the ties that threw our lot together with that of the dog may have had more to do with <coughs> non-human forces, <coughs> evolutionary adaptations of dogs to human society than any conscious intent or purpose on our part. And there are many examples in nature of animals that reap selective advantages by hanging around us. They get protection from predators. They get a source of food. Um, barn swallows, I mean, it's no coincidence they're called barn swallows. I mean, they nest preferentially in human-built structures. Um, and in fact, it's striking to me the kinds of adaptations. When I was researching um, my first book, The Covenant of the Wild, I was reading about many examples you can find of I mean, seagulls following fishing boats, um, uh, birds of prey often perching along highways, train tracks to grab prey flushed by, uh, you know, uh, human activity. Whenever I'm out mowing my field, um, I, uh, I'm accompanied constantly by, usually it's the chimney swifts, but also the barn swallows who are following the tractor around because it's flushing out all of these insects. Um, House mice, of course, again, they're called house mice uh, for a good reason. And, you know, even foxes, deer, and, and bear um, derive food and often other benefits by living near us and the modifications that we have created in the environment. It's not hard, I think, to speculate that proto-dog reaped similar benefits. Members of these you know, early ancestral subpopulations of the wild species that eventually became domesticated um, had a selective edge in the fight for survival. And that selective edge would have placed a premium on certain traits as well. Curiosity, a loss of fearfulness towards humans or other species in general, perhaps you could say, a loss of territoriality, a loss of adult type species specific recognition. And interestingly, just as there's evidence that as Conrad Lorenz and his uh, followers noted of um, the retention of uh, juvenile physical traits into adulthood in domestic species, there also appear um, to be a retention of juvenile behavioral characteristics, at least in dogs and perhaps other domestic species, vis-a-vis -vis their wild counterparts. And many of these characteristics would arguably increase this selective advantage of increasing dependence on us. On us. This process is usually referred to as neoteny, the retention into adulthood of juvenile characteristics. Um, in dogs, you definitely see this vis-a-vis -vis wolves, um, much increased uh, um, exhibiting play behavior throughout adulthood, food begging, which you don't see in adult wo wolves, but you do see in wolf puppies, exaggerated submissiveness, curiosity, as well as some non-adaptive traits that just come along as part of the baggage. Barking is an amazing one. I mean, wo adult wolves almost never bark. Wolf puppies do. Dogs, I mean, you know, Ray Coppinger talked, uh, mentions uh, having uh, record, recorded a domestic dog barking continuously from, I think it was 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. without cease, and um, it's, it is quite striking. And along with this retention into adulthood of juvenile traits, of course, comes a loss of wild type survival skills, which is why you don't see this. Um, 
But you do see this with neoteny at work, again, courtesy of Gary Larson. And again, it's also, it, 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 well, I shouldn't say again, it is also striking that with the sole exception of the cat, essentially all successful domesticated animals are social species, intensely social species. Even before you, you ask, well, what changes have taken place as a result of domestication? What changes have resulted as a result of neotenization? There were certain you know, behavioral, you could say biases, cognitive biases, pre-adaptations because of their ancestral ecological niche that have predisposed them to figuring us out and paying attention to us. I keep sheep, and I really was fascinated with this study, uh, again, just a few years ago, <laughs> on visual facial recognition in sheep. Now, it turns out the major way sheep no individual other sheep is by the appearance of their faces. Um, and this was actually an amazing study done. Um, they trained sheep, they showed sheep these computer images of two different sheep, and they would reward the sheep, the test sheep, for picking one of these two faces consistently. And they would show, for example, they would show if, if you look at the two in the upper right-hand corner, that pair, um, they would show the sheep these two images and say, give him some food whenever he nudged the panel with the sheep on the left. Uh, who you can see is different from the sheep on the right. It's got a wider nose and some other different facial characteristics. And then, thanks to the wonders of modern computer technology, they started morphing the images so they got closer and closer together and saw and tested, well, can the sheep still distinguish these two? And even when they were blended about 50%, the sheep was still able to pick the one it had been trained to pick. Um, I think at the, the bottom pair on the right are morphed to within a 10% difference, and at that point, the sheep really couldn't do it. Then they tried human faces on the sheep, did just as well. Then they tried this on people, and actually people didn't do any better than the sheep. Um, <laughs> and um, so, I mean, you know, what's the point I'm trying to make? Well, it's fast, I mean, there's no reason on earth that sheep, you could say, would be evolutionarily adapted to recognizing individual humans. But they were predisposed to study the faces of members in their society. And you can see how this could have been a huge selective advantage for proto-sheep of if there's one guy who was sort of interested in the sheep and would come out and you know, feed him or tolerate him, the sheep would say, hey, this is our buddy. We can, you don't have to worry about him. We've got to watch out for this strange person over here. There was um, a number of studies that got a lot of attention a few years ago suggesting that um, dogs and wolves raised in the same way were very different in their ability to interpret human visual cues. Um, but a, a more recent study suggested that, in fact, um, uh, wolves do quite well. The, the original studies had suggested, well, um, dogs, when presented with a problem, which of two buckets is the treat hidden under, um, would very readily start looking at the human being who was pointing at one or the other to figure it out when presented with an impossible problem of like a box that couldn't be opened, um, the study, the original study found, well, wolves would just get more and more frustrated and try more and more to sort of get the box open. The dogs would almost immediately like look at the human and say, huh, are you gonna help me or what? Um, but this more recent study um, by Clive Wynn's group at the University of Florida, um, he's been doing a lot of work with both wolves and dogs and um, they had this group of wolves that actually did extremely well, even outperformed dogs in following these visual cues. Again, they would hide food in, a, in one container or another, and the human uh, person running the experiment would point to one or the other, and the, the wolves learned very readily to follow these visual cues. 
Now, again, is there anything in the wolf that's a, an advantage to st studying where humans are pointing? No, probably not. It's probably just a coincidental bit of the wolf equipment, the wolf brain and behavior equipment of dealing with its world as a hunter, as a social animal. But again, it meant they were, uh, you know, when they first began to associate with humans, they were already pre-adapted to paying attention to us and to figuring out us. Um, and of course, ancient human beings in their capacity as hunters, for their part, began to show a fascination in studying animals. It's really interesting, as a recent uh, study by an anthropologist showed, that when you look at Pleistocene cave paintings, this is the first pictorial representations ever created by a human. It's all about animals. There are a few drawings of humans, but they're almost like stick figures. I mean, they're crude. They're nothing. The animals are incredible. They're incredibly detailed. They show motion. They show, I mean, this, you know, I, I think, you know, in, insight, I would say. I mean, there are these insightful depictions. Um, and again, this is before writing. This is possibly, you know, um, uh, before speech. I mean, it's really extraordinary that in our role as probably hunters mainly, but still, you know, I, I, I don't think it's sufficient as some an earlier generation of anthropologists were quick to say, oh, this is all about sort of hunting magic and creating you know, these totemic images, it shows this fascination with the most interesting thing to them in their world. And it wasn't trees, and it wasn't mountains, and it wasn't the weather, and it wasn't even their fellow human beings, it was animals. So by our own ancestry, I think we're natural observers and naturally fascinated with animals as well. Um, we're also the product of neoteny in our evolution, both physically and behaviorally. On the left, you see skulls of a chimpanzee from infancy to adulthood, and you see this clear change from this large forehead, shortened facial features to much more elongated <laughs> forms in the adult type. On the right, top and bottom, it's a human infant and an adult um, human, and it's striking this contrast, how neotenized the human skull is compared to the chimpanzee. A human adult retains this large forehead, definitely shortened facial features. Um, I came across this the other day. Uh, uh, this was in a uh, poem that uh, J.B.S. Haldane students presented him on his 60th birthday in 1952, Haldane great evolutionary biologist of the 20th century. And um, it was just sort of a throwaway line in there, but it, uh, this line about how we are sundered by neoteny from these are kin that crawl the earth. And, but in fact, far from sundering us, I think uh, it's uh, at least joined us with other domestic species that have undergone the same process. Again, here are some of the neotenic behaviors you see in dogs, the juvenile behaviors that are retained into adulthood, and here are some in humans. Play, it's extraordinary. I mean, compared to any other species, the desire and interest and fascination with play that's retained into adulthood in humans, um, you know, is, uh, is, is off the charts. Food sharing, again, except between parents and offspring, vanishes essentially completely in virtually all other species once adulthood is reached. It's part of every human society. Um, it's um, curiosity, again, uh, interest in novelty. And just as barking is a non-adaptive trait that probably is just part of the baggage that comes with this process, there's others that are similar analogous things in humans that are juvenile traits retained into adulthood as well. Um, well, I think if I want to summarize what I think might be the biological adaptations that bind our two species, in canines, I mentioned 
there's a pre-adaptation to this shared social structure and mutual curiosity. This was the, you know, wolves being attentive to human gestures, sheep recognizing faces, um, us being fascinated as hunting animals to studying and understanding animals. Um, domestication and the uh, process of behavioral neoteny certainly uh, selected for other characteristics on the part of dogs that uh, have bound them increasingly to human society. The mere fact that they are now proximate to us, that they live with us, they live near us, they have opportunities as they grow to experience things, to learn, to study us, to apply this instinct of curiosity and fascination to figuring us out and using us as part of their environment. Um, humans, there was, as I mentioned, Conrad Lorenz's study of this basic activation of emotional pathways. Um, there's utilitarian appreciation of purpose-bred um, breeds. There's, for the dogs that don't fit into those categories, a perhaps resignation to the inevitable, we can't get rid of them even if we want to. And I think, too, it, which is probably a neglected explanation, and to me is an increasingly important one, it's our own curiosity and sense of scientific wonder. And for me, as I've written in a number of my books, to me that's part of the enduring fascination and joy and insight that I get from the dogs and horses in my life in particular, even when they are useless. It's this feeling of seeing the world through a different mind and a different set of eyes. And I guess if I have a take-home uh, message today, it's uh, beware of scientists bearing unicausal explanations. The story of what ties us together is probably richer than any one explanation. Um, there are many things that tie us together um, from the sublime to the ridiculous and from need to desire and from utility to a sense of enduring wonder. Thank you very much.